turkey pot pies welcome to another episode of you might know her from it's a very special one with damien <laughs> and Anne. i put you on the spot there Hello and welcome to our Thanksgiving episode. If you celebrate, <laughs> we are going to have a feast for your ears this week. And we are just going to throw a whole lot at you. I think what I was telling Anne is this is going to be a smorgasbord of an episode. It's going to be a feast for your ears, a real cornucopia of all of our disparate and wild thoughts. <laughs> Thank you, smorgasbord. Shm- I'm going to say smorgasbord makes me think of Templeton, who we were just speaking about with our beloved Jason and Daniel of Grumpy Entertainment and about how Templeton is the one of the greatest characters in like all of literature and also the cartoon charlotte's web like has a real soft spot for me because it's the voice of poland so we are all templeton today we are hoarding rotten eggs i hope that you're doing the same as damien said it's going to be an audio cornucopia so just go with us because we have a lot to cover damien what was important for us this week i mean i'm gonna say that the thing that has been most shocking about 2021 and there's been so many things but the thing that has been most shocking is that a new tradition i have is sitting with my best friend and the co-host of this podcast ann rodeman and we dine together and watch in earnest in real time dancing with the stars and like root <laughs> this week we both tried to vote apparently we missed the window we literally the same thing happened two weeks prior we tried to vote it's literally i thought we were doing it within like one minute and they're like voting has closed i think it's all sham yeah but it really is like one of the most uh, like humane but also like octogenarian things that we've done in recent past and it's a really nice ritual i like come over you cook dinner ronnie gets a bone <laughs> we have a bottle of wine then we maybe open a second bottle of something while we watch dancing with the stars look The show is good. It's got Mm. fresh life with Tyra Banks. You know we love Tom Bergeron, as we've said before. But they, I think, have, like, perfected the format. At time of recording, we just watched the semifinals. Yes. And I know that the finals will be out by the time Thanksgiving week arrives. But the real story here is, of course, the gay evolution of Jojo Siwa, who I know was out before the show debuted. I'm sure that she timed that with her publicist. But (laughs) let me tell you, watching those early dances, she's dancing with a woman, which is unprecedented. But those early dances, there's not much gay content happening. Now that we just watched the semifinals, the gayness is off the charts. It's out of control, real lesbianism. And when I tell you that like so many actresses, dancers, celebrities irritate me by like talking about having slept with a woman, dating with quotes around it, a woman, et cetera. And then eventually just like, that's a forgotten piece of their history. I really am telling you that like Jojo Siwa gives off like a hundred percent like Kinsey, literally (laughs) she is a lesbian. The energy is like full blown lesbian. We watched this week's episode. We loved it. Of course, we tried to vote for Jojo unsuccessfully. And then as we were like wrapping up Anne was like, what do you want to watch? Like we wish to like watch one clip. And then we watched like seven clips and they were all Jojo's dances. (laughs) And Anne was watching and she was like, look, this is like her. She's like doing that thing. She's like performing. Performing. She's like putting her performer face on. Then it was like, and then in like week four, I think it was maybe Grease Week where she, like yeah. they were very connected. Totally emotionally connected. And then the following week, I think one week was Queen Week and they did body language and it was like, uh, they're like scissoring. This is intense. There's just like a real sexual awakening happening but like behind her eyes. She's also like sort of dominating like as a lead dancer in the piece with anyway I'm just like very into the whole thing she's clearly very emotionally attached to Jenna because I feel like Jenna has basically been her like sexual awakening like into her body who knows if she had sex with her first girlfriend I don't need to think about it she was underage probably (laughs) but what I'm saying is I think that Jenna is the person that's gotten her most in touch with her body look I don't know what to do with that information. It's just really nice to see a young person coming into their own. And that's how I feel about watching Jojo Siwa become a true full-blown lesbian on ABC. Oh, my God. Think of this Jojo Siwa talk as a appetizer. (laughs) It's an appetizer for this episode. My heart is racing thinking about how I need Jojo Siwa to win. Okay. So aside from Jojo, tell me what's on the top. I'm sure it was also Jojo. But tell me what else is in the forefront of your brain. I would be remiss honestly, if we did not discuss something that has been long held for me, one of my most important positions, something I stridently yell at every person I've ever met. And that is, of course, that Kirk Douglas raped Natalie Wood. Now, it has been officially, unofficially confirmed by Lana Wood, Natalie Wood's sister, 
Recently in her new book, she always said that she was never going to name the person until he died. Well, whoops, he up and died, what, last year, two years yeah. ago? Mm-hmm. Now that he's officially dead, she has named Kirk Douglas as the person that did violently rape Natalie Wood. And you know what? It's like it's been an open secret. And remember, like, the year that it was basically, like, made headlines? Was it the Golden Globes or the Oscars, like, honored him with a Lifetime Achievement Award? Yes. I was like, this is ups- it's deeply upsetting. It was, like, the year of Me Too. They're not reading the room. I just feel really vindicated. So, you know, as we discussed, Thanksgiving is a complicated holiday, uh, you know, because it's, like, rooted in slaughter and raping and pillaging. But I feel grateful that I have finally been vindicated and like this is now national news. It was like in Variety and the Hollywood Reporter and the Daily News and like the Daily Mail, the Guardian, everyone's picking up this story. And you know what? I think that I don't know if somebody asked Michael Douglas like for his comment, but like he said something to the effect of like, God rest both of their souls. And I was like, uh, that is acknowledgement as far as I'm concerned. Maybe Michael Douglas has been grappling with it all this time. But if you know this podcast, you know that it's a real passion project for me to spread the gospel of Kirk Douglas having raped Natalie Wood. Please just go watch a Natalie Wood movie this holiday. Like, we're coming up uh, around Time for Miracle on 34th Street. Recommend Splendor in the Grass, West Side Story, of course. Like, she's going to be very relevant come December. Yeah, that's a great point, actually. Maybe we should do something with Natalie Wood for our Christmas episode. Something that's a great idea. I love her so much. think about. Marinate on it. She's one of my favorite celebrities of all time. I used to love her, but I felt complicated by her her not singing in West Side Story like in hindsight you know like at the time I think I probably well, she didn't tried that. Damien she tried but they they lied to her and told her she was going to get to sing she recorded you can listen to the original audio on YouTube it's rough and then who is Marnie Nixon her voice yeah it is yeah sweet okay. Marnie Nixon and then but she did her own singing in Gypsy correct correct I've yeah. never seen the Gypsy film Maybe I'll watch it for Christmas. I have a soft spot for it. I'm not convinced that it's good, but I do love it. I do think that she is just like one of the most enigmatic stars of like the Hollywood era. I I don't think she's, you know, a thousand percent my number one greatest actress. And also like having her cast as Maria is also a problem. But I just think there's something really sweet and wonderful and smart about her. I watched Bob and Carol and Ted and Alice for the first time during the pandemic. And I was like, she's fucking sexy and strange. I'm very into everything she's giving. Is Julie Christie the other woman in that? No, who is the other woman in that movie? Let's look it up. I want to keep guessing people and not looking. Is just it, keep look, just keep guessing. Is it Diane Carroll? No. Oh, you're close. It's Diane Cannon. That's who I meant. I knew Diane Carroll is, is <laughs> right. a black woman and just passed yes. recently. And I yes. knew I, I knew it was Diane Cannon. I just couldn't remember. Diane her Cannon. Yeah, That's you got it right. Good on me. I have a question for you. I'm into like Elliot Gould having been a sex symbol in the 70s. Mm-hmm. Like, does he do it for you? Yeah. I mean, in his prime, for sure. Yeah, I love that he was like unbuttoned shirt, like down to his belly button with like a gold chain and huge like Elaine Stritch sunglasses on. He was like a sex symbol. I, I didn't love it. get it. And like, I remember when he was on Friends because he was Ross and Monica's mm. dad. And I was like, oh, he's, I don't know. That's like, what was my frame of reference or who he was? And he was sort of like, I don't know, just like not a person I would have ever considered attractive. And then... I remember like seeing him a young photo and I was like, oh, he's like a babe. Ooh. And then I figured out that mm-hmm. people were like into that. That was like established. Like, yeah, he's cool. He has like a look and also like the fashion of that era. Like he had, I don't know if he had a per- he has curly hair or if he had a perm, but like it yeah. was such a specific time. My father had a perm. Did he really? My dad did too. Actually, now that you're saying that, it's like, oh, right. We all, I mean, I had a perm too. We all had perms in my family. Well, I never had a perm. I think this is the year of a perm for you. Thinking, thinking about, about it. it. Yeah, I'm You're kombucha girling it. it. Maybe? No, maybe. <laughs> okay. Thank you for bearing through my Thanksgiving rants. It really is the time to really settle into the old, but also appreciate the new. So let's move on to our main course. We decided this season to break out something that we like to call the warm blanket movie. And that is, of course, Clueless, the American classic that we've seen so many times But also is like never, I'm never mad when it's on, you know, like I'm going to tell you the opening third of Clueless is like one of the happiest, like I think it's just like one of the best 30 minutes that exists on screen. It's so fun. It's so comforting. So it was really fun to revisit the whole thing. Clueless for me is a movie. I remember seeing it. I was visiting my eldest sister in her apartment while she was in law school in Philadelphia and me and my other sister were there I guess for a weekend I don't really know what was happening but we were there and I remember they rented that in the little rascals for me I guess and we watched them (laughs) 
and I loved them, both of those movies, deeply. It's also the first time I ever had, I think I had grapefruit soda. I can't remember if it was grapefruit or pineapple. Maybe it was pineapple mm. soda, and I was like, I love this. I've never even had that. And we watched Clueless, and I was obsessed with it. And then I, like, for, that was in 1990, I don't know, it was probably 1995 or 96, maybe, but probably 95. And, you know, and I've just been obsessed with it since. I had the VHS, then the DVD. I read the book series at the time. Then mm, when I, my friend the Brian. The soundtrack, of course. The soundtrack is excellent. I owned it on CD. I probably still own it. Then, you know, I, of course, my friends and I were obsessed with it. Then, like, my, me and my friends, like, Nora and my, like, the girls that I would friends with, like, were obsessed with it. I always wanted to have, like, the cell phone that they had. And they A phone, a house phone came out at the time that was, like, in the style of, I don't even know if it was in the movie, really. It was like a phone, though, that was supposed to be, like, hands-free. And, like, it was, like, you could put it in your earpiece. And it was, like, it was the equivalent of, like, the lips phone of the 80s. It was, like, that yeah, for yeah, the yeah. 90s. You know, and then I met my friend Brian in college. And it was, like, a thing that he and I used to watch is, like, to get, like if I would visit him in L.A., like, this was, like, 10 years ago. It was, like, we would put it on to, like, go to bed. Like, when we were, like, come home from going out and we would, like, watch it. And then he took me on a tour of all the hot spots a couple years ago when I was there. Like, I went to where she gets mugged in her ally address. So, like, Wait, you I did? Loved, really? I was yeah, thinking like, we about, a, like, how I had never been to that location. I was like, what the signage there is so good. We couldn't go to the house, I don't think, because it was, like... Under rent, we went to one house, but we couldn't go to another. But I remember specifically circus. What is it called? Circus liquor. I forget now. But mm-hmm. and I like yeah. took a photo. It has like there. a big clown, like a neon clown. Yeah, it's. I we went on like a mini tour, and it was so fun. And I just like I love this movie deeply because it does comfort me, and also because like I know the beats, and it's one of those things like. If I'm on an airplane and I feel like I'm having anxiety and it's available to watch, sometimes I choose to watch a movie I already know if yeah. I'm feeling anxious. Not like from fear of flying, but like my life, I'm like, oh, I have so much to do. And it's like I'm on an airplane and I feel kind of claustrophobic. Let me watch like Clueless or Grease or Clue or Bring It On or something like that I know that I like liked as a young person because I know all of the beats and it's a little calming. But really. Yeah, no, no, no. I hear you. I feel like that's why... It's, you know, it like stands the test of time. And I feel like going back to visit it, it's, okay, 1995, written and directed by Amy Heckerly. And of course, here was a reveal for me. Associate produced by Twink Kaplan, who <gasps> stars as Miss Geist. And I had no idea. She also, I went to her IMDb, Twink Kaplan, also associate produced Curly Sue, one of my favorite childhood movies, where that child eats like a whole thing of pizza and then sucks on each one of her fingers. <laughs> Is Twink Kaplan also in Curly Sue? I'm looking right now. I'm really like I would love to get what's her name Allison who starred as Curly Sue and then she like won the voice correct I'm very invested in getting her for the show hold on Twink Kaplan too like I don't know if this is or is not surprising but like I'm like physically drawn to her in Clueless there's something very attractive about her I think she's hot maybe it's the like she like it is like when Dion's like that tiny little waist and she's like wrapping her cardigan like around her waist and then they're undoing her clips in her hair I was like oh she looks good this is like one of my favorite like 90s makeovers is the like literal 12 seconds they spend on Miss Geist. Are they best friends, Amy Heckerling and Twin Kaplan, or did I make that up? Oh, interesting. You know what? I don't I don't know, but you Because know, I think she... that Twin Kaplan's also in A Night at the Roxbury, which Amy ah. Heckerling was like a big producer on. And you know there's a story there. Okay, well, let's cover this right now. Let's just get into it. Make those reveals because we teased them last week. Twin Kaplan is, does not appear to be in Curly Sue. Part two, she is, as you said, in A Night at the Roxbury, which was supposed to be written by... Amy Heckerling. Yeah, and she's also, I'm sorry, she's also in Look Who's Talking 2 that Amy Heckerling directed. She's in Loser, <gasps> which Amy Heckerling directed. She's okay, in Look so Who's you're right. Talking, they're like, which they're pals. She's I Could I Could Never Be Your Woman, which is like Michelle Pfeiffer, Paul Rudd, <gasps> Shea Sharon, and Tracy Ullman. I think Stacey oh Dash has a small God. role in it. Oh, my I could never be a woman. So I think that they are friends. And I think, I don't know if the Quint t- Twink was a... Is t- also is Twink her stage? Is her stage name? Is that? I have no idea. I'm obsessed with it. I love it. I also think like, what if they are best friends? And she was like, "Look, Twink, you're going to be in this movie. I got a role for you in Miss Geist, but I'm also going to make you an associate producer, so you can like make two decisions. But then you're like, what if she <laughs> makes like her life, her living off of being an associate producer on Clueless? Do you know? Like, is that a possibility because it's such a mega hit? I mean, I I think maybe. I don't know actually, but maybe. Can I ask? I just this? feel like that's going to be like a good producer credit. Who do you think is a Twink Kaplan type? Like who could have played Miss Geist? I have an idea of somebody that I think. Oh my God. I was reading. No, no, no. It was somebody else that was auditioning for it. Tell me who you have in mind. Oh, I I know. Mindy Sterling. Yes! (laughs) (laughs) Oh my God. (laughs) She's a total Mindy Sterling type. Oh my God. I love you. I love you. (laughs) Poor Ronnie. (laughs) 
Oh God, she <laughs> deserves a cow ear for that. Ronnie also Absolutely. every time we were screaming about jo- JoJo see while Ronnie was reacting to us, like screaming and. <laughs> I mean, Ronnie's also watched me like ball crying watching TV, so she like is used to it, but she does react. Right. Yes, You're Mindy so right. Sterling. I love that we we're on the same page. Who listeners you might be most familiar with you might know her from for, as Frau Farbissina in the Austin Powers films. I think that she could have been a twin Kaplan uh, as Miss Geist type. Totally. I'm just, I'm going to say on the record, by the way, that I love Austin Powers. I just want to put that out there. I don't think I've said those words on this podcast, but I think Austin Powers one is a classic. Yeah. I mean, I absolutely agree. I think the first two are stellar. Yeah. The third is an embarrassment. Okay. So back to twin Kaplan. Yes. And let's get back to Amy Heckerling and what you mentioned that I really think is an important reveal. So twin Kaplan appears in night at the Roxbury. I don't know if you folks remember that, but it was an SNL movie with Will Ferrell and Chris Kattan as those guys who shake their heads in the club. It's really the only part that's important. I'll just give you context. So the rumor goes, or like the story is, that Amy Heckerling was somehow attached to this film that she ended up just becoming a producer on, but I think maybe she was supposed to write it or write and direct it. And there was like some litigation, right? Mm -hmm. That involved... Amy and Chris Kattan. And and you really fell down the rabbit hole. So tell me, tell us. All right. So I'm not going to reread it. So here's my understanding of having read it three months ago. (laughs) (laughs) This is me just giving alleged content. Okay. So Chris Kattan alleges that Lorne Michaels suggested that he sleep with Amy Heckerling in order to convince her to write the movie version of A Night at the Roxbury, their SNL sketch, which I just think is fucking outrageous because first of all, like Amy Heckerling is a superstar writer director. Like she doesn't need to be like wooed by fucking Chris Kattan in order to say yes or no to a project. Like she's not going to say yes because she like had to fuck Chris Kattan. Also, I think it's probably a blatant lie. So there's that and I'm not into it at all. Chris Kattan also an interesting character because he and Jennifer Coolidge dated for a very long time. Also, fascinating yeah yeah so i can't remember like if they ever act like if he and amy heckerling actually dated i I think it was really just this like alleged lawsuit so that's interesting point one the other interesting point from amy heckerling's wiki is that she was apparently long-term partnered dating 80s superstar bronson pinchot who is of course balky from perfect strangers and is in the Beverly Hills Cop movies. I don't know what else. I mean, I know him from putting it together on Broadway with Carol Burnett. I find him to be deeply off-putting. I, I love Amy Heckerling, but I don't know how to reconcile the Bronson Pinchot show of it all. It's just interesting. And I'm I when I like I never knew what Amy Heckerling looked like, and then I Googled her and I was like, oh, I want Amy Sherman Palladino to be like Amy Heckerling, but she's like not. She's like Amy Heckerling via steampunk she's like steampunk amy heckerling yeah she's like amy heckerling by way of linda perry yeah. <laughs> it's like a hat and like a lot so let's get, let's get back to the movie what are like the like for you what are the touchstones of a film like the highlights for me as i was saying the first 30 minutes like the world building as it were is some of the most satisfying cinema like i can imagine okay well f- the first thing that comes to mind is the makeover i find makeovers very incredible um, <laughs> just like incredible pieces of cinema and yeah. then playing supermodel and like washing the kool-aid hair mm. dye out of her hair and then yeah. putting this the cans of soda like as curlers in her hair is just like it's to me that is cinematic and cinema so that is probably my favorite part I also love the opening like five minutes where there's sort of like a montage of like you might think this is an Oxima commercial and it's like them in a soda shop and then it's like them by a fat like a like a waterfall and then you get to see her like putting her, her outfit together via that app and it's like David Bowie fashion is playing like I love that I love the Mighty Mighty Boston's concert these are like my favorite is- parts Okay, the the fact that like like nineties like ska and swing was a thing and that like the Mighty Mighty Bostones made it into this movie is just so radical to me that they were the band that is immortalized in Clueless. It's sort of the beginning of, I believe, the beginning of that moment because mm. when you think about like ninety nine, two thousand, that is when like Brian Setzer Orchestra, Jump Jive and Whale was like in commercials and like that's when oh I was like God. doing swing Cherry moves. Cherry Pop and Dad. Yeah, and I was like doing swing moves at the like the the <laughs> sophomore dance with my high school girlfriend, you know, like yeah i forgot that just a girl is in the movie so it has like a weird scott influence Mm, that i had mm. not remembered but it's very that scene is very like peach pit after dark for me (laughs) yeah 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 yeah. i can see it (laughs) i sometimes love movies that i've loved for so long because the ways that 
like you know how kids have like their favorite part and i don't think that that yeah we don't we're not sort of afforded that sort of preciousness as adults where we say like this is my favorite part i just want to watch it over and over again although me and you maybe do like we will rewatch like jojo siwa's dances <laughs> so i love watching movies like that like like movies that I loved as a kid and I watched obsessively because I still have like my, my favorite parts that are just familiar to me. Yeah. So for me, like the makeover is like numero uno. What about you? Yeah, I I agree. I think I wrote down like montages. For me, the montages in this film are perfect. The montage with Mr. Hall and Miss Geist. And then of course the makeover montage for Ty. I have to say like I had and I still have little to no interest in the love story because it creeps me out. And like Emma was not an important book to me. Is the premise in Emma though that she falls in love with her brother? It's not. I think it's like, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I haven't read it. It was like not important to me. I didn't grow up loving Jane Austen. And so I felt like, I was creeped out by the whole thing. And then when I was like revealed that that was where the movie was going, I, I remember seeing it for the first time. I was like, where is this going? Who is she going to end up with? Like, who is the love interest? And then I was like, oh, distressing. So I think Paul Rudd is perfectly charming and great, but like, I don't care about the love story at all. That being said, like, I love all of the stuff between the women. And I have to say, like, I came away thinking, okay, one of my favorite men of all time, Dan Hedaya perfect performance. I read the IMDb trivia that it was one of his favorite film experiences of all time. I think he's so good in everything. I love him in this. I love him in Dick. I love him in First Wives Club. I love him in The Addams Family. Like he is a perfect character actor. Do you love him in the, what is it called? The, the Tarantellis? Oh my God. Opposite former guest of the show, Mandy Ingber, who I was like, were you sexually attracted to Dan Hedaya? And she was like, what did you say? <laughs> she said, he, I think, did she tell us he couldn't remember his lines or am I remember? I think she said that he like would never rehearse. So he like marked his lines with gibberish. So they would like go on set for rehearsal. It was a spinoff of Cheers. And so she played his daughter on Cheers and then they got a spinoff. And so she said when they were rehearsing, he would just be like, hubba hubba, libbity lobbity, ibulu blop blop going to his trailer now, which I thought was kind of funny. But this is obviously, he's the like one kind of man I love like he's in the Dabney Coleman and Gene Hackman category for me oh I see that so I love him and I also you know I had a troubled history with Donald Faison because I really hate scrubs and I have never watched a single episode I just like it hurts something about it hurts I could never watch it and I know a lot of people love it and I love Judy Reyes and I love some of the other cast members but I just could never sit through it so he was like on my shit list for a while but now he's on Elward Generation Q and I thought he was quite charming so I had to come back around with Donald Faison but I have to say watching him in this he's so good and also his line readings like ring in my ears like him saying woman and him like all of like the freeway bit i think is my new favorite scene in the movie oh that's a good one yeah 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 and also dion has that great doily hat on oh it's so good yes i i forgot how great that scene was and it was like i audibly laughed out loud and i don't remember the last time that has happened i was like this is a perfect scene the physical comedy of it and the elevation They're of all the so comedy good. in the scene is so good and like the people yelling out the window at them and the truck like about to run them over and then like before that there's the gay reveal about christian i just thought donald Faison was so funny in that scene and you know again i don't know why i'm like your boy is a cake eater <laughs> nah uh no way <laughs> yes way yeah he's so good his line readings are so good also i read that he chose to have braces in the movie so his teeth wouldn't look as small did you read this fact i was <laughs> no, like oh no. my god and then i was like were his teeth small and then i googled it and it's like they sure enough were and now he has huge <laughs> veneers is he still married to jessica simpson's a former assistant that sounds casey something right? she was on newlyweds and then he got that married sounds right that sounds right no i was pleasantly surprised because for me the movie is always about like Cher, dion and ty and amber and like the women were always central to me and they still are. But I was like surprised at how charmed I was by Donald Faison and how funny he was in this. Can we talk about another great woman in the film besides Twain Kaplan, besides all the women you just mentioned? And that, of course, is comedy icon Julie Brown playing oh my a lesbian. God. <laughs> so good. He, that's the thing is like the movie deals in all of these really obvious like high school tropes that I would usually find very irritating, like the lesbian gym teacher. But I found it so charming that Amy Heckerling like cast her in the movie and she seemed so right and so down and the jokes were so good that, you know, there's like the stoners and the nerds and the hot girls that are idiots and then like the lesbian gym teacher. But like, I think she's brilliant. Mrs. Stover. <laughs> My plastic surgeon says, so good. The lines are literally iconic. And I, I was thinking about how 
the movie, even when I was a teenager, when I saw it, it was like, it instantly seemed iconic. And I don't think that's just hindsight. I really think like what they did is create a world that wasn't quite a real world, but it was like an elevated version of it. And the language and all of it is like its own universe. It's not quite reality, but it all seems somehow kind of real. Like they live in a world where like Christian Slater and Luke Perry are the reference points, which Mm -hmm. I love, but it also is like very strange. And they're wearing things that like people weren't really wearing at the time. I totally agree with that. What are some of, we talked about a million, just a lot, a lot, a million catchphrases right now, but is there any in particular that strike you? Because I, there's one that, that I always laughed at and like, I didn't understand it as a young person. And now I laugh and it makes me think of you, honestly. And do you know where I'm going with this? Oh my God. No, tell me. It's when she's like, Mr. Hall, I was like, I object to this tardy. <laughs> like what was the date of this alleged tardy? And he tells her the date. And then she's like, I was like riding the crimson wave. I had to haul ass to the ladies. <laughs> It's so cool. It's so cool. I, yeah, I forgot about that scene. It, it, I feel like the way they set up Cher is so great because like she's kind of like dumb slash a little mean, but then also somehow is like sweet and lovable. Like she isn't actually one thing, no, which yeah. is sort of surprising for a high school movie that she sort of contains multitudes, but like she's also kind of hateful and mean in ways. I think Alicia Silverstone is so good. I think that Stacey Dash is so good. I think Brittany Murphy is incredible. I know. Brittany Murphy is so good. Like, rest in peace. She was such a good actor and, like, continued to be a great actor and to, like, she was getting good roles. Of the three of them, she was really getting sort of the most, like, juiciest stuff. Totally. And like had an evolution. Remember her in Eight Mile? Like she was like doing dark. And material. like what was the one with Michael Douglas, son of rapist Kirk Douglas? Oh she, my god. I'll I'll never tell. Tell. And she was like doing that I thing with her that. hand. Yeah. And she you know, she had a really like interesting career. She was in Girl Interrupted, much discussed here. Oh, she was one of god, the central right. women. It was like yeah. her, Clea Duval, Gillian Armanante, Angelina mm. Jolie, and Elizabeth Moss and Brittany Murphy. I mean, it really is heartbreaking. I haven't watched the HBO documentary about her yet, but it's like so nice to go back and watch her. Also, remember that like she was a singer, like she could legit sing. Do you remember that movie Happy Feet, that animated movie? Yeah, she did like a cover of a Queen song? I think that's right. And she also had that song that was like a club track. It was like a dance song called Faster Kill Pussycat. And I don't know who the artist is, but she was the featured vocalist. And and it she's good. Listen to uh, folks, whatever you're doing. Write it down or pause and go pull up the song and like be impressed with Brittany Murphy's vocals. Baby, go to the show notes. That's where it's going to reside. <laughs> I did not know that. That's a great fact. But I was thinking like when she sings her like one bar of Rolling with the Homies, you're like, oh, she can sing. She mm. can like that's legit true. Sing. That's actually that's true. <laughs> also, she was a stage actress. Remember, she was in a production of the Broadway production of A View from the Bridge. <gasps> she was in the Broadway, oh, the pre-Broadway production, God. not the one with I... Jessica Hecht and Scarlett Johansson. That was Johansson. the one with Allison Janney. And um, right? yes, Allison Janney and Anthony Mapalia. M- Thank you. Yeah, I completely forgot about that, and I feel heartbroken that I didn't get to see that. She, I think, was sort of like a generational talent that we didn't get to see. Obviously, reach her full potential. But the movie is a great testament, like how charming she is. She like comes out of nowhere, and you're like, oh, I love this girl already. She's so great. And she and Breck and Meyer are so cute together. I love that pairing. I'm very charmed by him, too. Okay, so I have one question for you in the vein of the Julie Brown thing, which is like, were you A, hot for Christian, and B, like, when, as a teenager, did you pick up in the movie that he was gay? As a young person, did I pick up that he was gay? Right, like, did you get the Spartacus jokes and, like, all the things before the reveals? I don't, I mean, I I actually don't really remember, but I assume that it kind of just went over my head, honestly. What what about you? Do you remember? Yeah, no, I don't, I don't know if I did either, but like now I feel like I picked up on all of the things that I didn't know. Sporadicus made me laugh very hard too. But yeah, now I know about the gay scenes in Spartacus and the Billie Holiday joke and, you know, all of it. But he is like very much like a short Jason Priestley, I guess, is like. Oh, fascinating. And I. I understood what they were going for, but I'm not sure I agree with the casting of Christian. And I think that overall, I would say the casting is a thousand percent excellent. I'm like, Elisa Donovan is so good. I think that what's his face, Jeremy Sisto is so good. I don't know that I agree that like that actor was like as hot as everyone in the movie said he was. Did you think he was hot? Christian? Yeah, he's not hot. Okay, so right. So meaning like I didn't get that Cher would go for him. I got that he was like, you know, worldly or something. And he had really good hair and he has a good profile. But honestly, I thought they could have cast like Jason Priestley or something. Cast Jamie Walters. Oh my gosh. Is that Ray Pruitt? (laughs) Yeah. My final thought about Clueless is that there was a musical version of it 
in, in like 2018, 2019 that played in New York starring Dove Cameron as Cher and it used oh 90s music. God, saw, um, it, it used Kids in America and Supermodel and I think and Amy Heckerling like rewrote lyrics to these 90s songs to like help move story along. And I, mm. my question it, to you and to myself is like, why didn't we see this? It seems like a total yeah. thing I would see. Yeah, completely. That's odd. I do remember that. And also, I just hope that, like, I feel like they'll probably drum it up for, like, the 30th anniversary and, like, get it on Broadway or something. They'll get somebody to actually write songs for it. Because it does seem like it would easily translate to musical form since they've made, like, Mean Girls and every other, like, high school show into a musical. If you saw it in New York City, please slide into my DMs. I'd love to know. Or if you saw it elsewhere, I guess, if it had an other, like, out-of-town tryouts. But yeah. I'd love to know if you saw that production. I hope Twink Kaplan got a cut wherever she was. (laughs) Clueless is streaming right now on HBO Max. You can buy it wherever you buy your movies. If you need something comforting to watch, I hope that you're watching it over this holiday week when you have some time off, if you're alone, if you're with family. I just think it's a crowd pleaser. And we thought it would be a great idea because when we come back to you next week with an actress interview, we'll be speaking to somebody that was in Clueless, the film. (gasps) I'm very excited for it. I'm really excited, very excited for y'all to hear it. I think it's going to be a, a supreme way to start your December. Mm-hmm. So, darlings, we've had the antipasto. We've had our second course. We had our entree. And now we're reaching time for dessert. So unbutton your top button and stay tuned after the credits because we are giving you something that is very important for you Facts of Life fans out there. We know we have a lot of you. And this clip was a shining star for us, and we just wanted to make sure that it saw the light of day because it's about the first cast of The Facts of Life. We got to talk to Mindy Cohn, previous guest of the show, about that first year where the cast looked very different and where those women are today. Of course, that cast included movie star Molly Ringwald. It's a juicy one. Also, like I feel like The Facts of Life fans are invested in the, those like quote-unquote lost girls, so... I think you'll like what you hear. So stick around after the credits for that clip with Mindy. And folks, if you like what we're doing, if you like our episodes with just us, if you like the episodes with actor interviews better, if you like what we're doing in general, (laughs) please leave us a review. Make sure that you are subscribed, liking and sharing our podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. And then please leave us a little written review in the Apple Podcast app. You can leave us an emoji or just a few nice words, or you can leave the name of an actor that you'd like for us to interview in the future. Truly, madly, deeply, we are working on the folks that you send us in our DMs and in our email and all of that. And if you want more JoJo Siwa, more Natalie Wood, more morning show content, I haven't even gone deep on the morning show this week. Let me tell you, the show is fucking unhinged. Follow us on all mediums of social media. Damien is at Damien Bellino. That's Damien with an A. And I'm at Rodeman. That's R-O-D-E-M-A-N-N-E. might know her from is produced by us that's Damian Bellino and my co-host Ann Rodeman who I am very thankful and grateful for this Thanksgiving season we also are so grateful for our consultants at Grumby Entertainment that would be Jason Jude Hill and Daniel Sears and all of that like really excellent expert editing is by the great Daniel Sears And of course, a hearty thank you to Gang. Gang's music is the sweet tunes that you hear under each and every episode of You Might Know Her From. Go listen and download Gang's music wherever you listen to those sweet, sweet tunes. Also, if you need to hear that Brittany Murphy bop, it's going to be in the show notes. You know where to look, honeys. Okay, Mindy, on the first season of The Facts of Life, the cast was much larger and featured you, Kim Fields, Lisa Welchel, no Nancy McKeon, and then several other young women who were let go at the end of that season. And there's a whole online community, I don't know if you know this, of Facts of Life Mm -hmm. fans that are obsessed with the season one cast and dub them the Lost Girls. Rightly so. When's the last time you saw any of these women? Felice Schachter, Julianne Haddock, Julie Pizarki, and Molly Ringwald. I hope I said all their names right. Well, Julie Pekarski, I saw a month and a half ago. She moved back to L.A. We had coffee. <gasps> I love that. Molly Ringwald, I didn't see, but I we DM'd each other. When you did The Secret Life of American Teenager, yeah. Exactly. Felice Schachter, again, over Instagram, because I'm friends with her sister, Simone Schachter, who's now doesn't go by that name. 
Levin. She's now Simone Levinson. A year or two. And Julianne Haddock, same Instagram. Not frequently. I love that. You know, not recently, I mean. But it's sweet. Like, that's, con- like, that's, you're generous. And that's sweet that you, like, think of them and fondly still. You know, I mean, I feel like you could have been a jerk. And that's kind. Oh, my God. Why would I have been a jerk? Why would I be a jerk? Not you specifically, just that you were the person that got to go on and have seasons of the show. And it was like, what a coulda, woulda, shoulda for them, I guess. Listen, uh, Kim and I talked about it for years about just luck of the Irish or because, you know, Natalie and Tootie weren't even a thing then. You know, it's like I understood Blair and I I understood them getting Nancy. But I, I, I you, yeah, same. Just serendipity. You can't. Mm-hmm. And I have to say, they all handled it because they came back and did a couple episodes through, throughout the years. I think two. They handled it so beautifully, you know, with such great attitude. And then look what happened to Molly. I mean, that's the best fuck you ever. Right. Just become a major film star. Bravo. 